If you're a fan of Dr. Strangelove, you might have guessed that the title is tongue in cheek. Uh, just as the bomb is the subject of satire in that 1964 film, I do not actually harbor any love for process. In fact, I think process is one of the fastest ways to dehumanize individuals and introduce undue complexity. Yes, starting off with bold statements here. Um, in our organizations, in building products, we want to empower people. We want to instill customer orientation. We want to leverage adaptive technologies and respond to unanticipated change. We know these things are really important. And this talk is about how some of the metrics and processes we use go against this. Our management practices are lagging behind our product development and software engineering practices. So today, I wanna to talk more about that and offer you an alternative worldview on effectiveness, straight from a scrum master. So like Nate said, uh, this wouldn't have been possible without the sponsors. And I'm feeling very thankful that we are holding a Connectaha at all this year. Um, thanks to Brian and Nate for thinking outside the box on this. Uh, Connectaha's goal is for people to grow quality connections in a diverse environment. Uh, it's about attendees, speakers, and sponsors exchanging new ideas, knowledge, and views. Um, so join the conversation. Um, you've got the hashtag, you've got the Zoom chat, and I'm uh, really taking an idea-centric approach with what I'm sharing in this presentation, and I hope you will uh, both sit with it yourself, work with these ideas, and also talk to others, uh, reach out to others about these ideas and see what sticks. So I'm Kathy Anderson. Uh, I am a scaled scrum master or delivery manager, and I'm proud to work at Huddle with many talented individuals and teams. Instead of a uh, rap sheet about my history or um, what I've done, um, you pictured here, you see some of the organizations which have shaped uh, my experience. Um, you know, we, we love our laptop stickers. Here's a, here's a digital view of what that could look like if you went back through my life. Uh, as many of us find out, career paths are often winding and unpredictable. I agree with what Hillary said this morning, that it's important to value our history and uniqueness as whole people, because we bring that with us and that makes us even better at what we do. And relevant to the ideas I'm sharing today, to the topic today, I find a lot of the thinking I do uh, about my work, about complex systems, is uh, aided by my college course coursework in environmental science and biogeochemistry. Uh, I pursued a biology major for the majority of my college career uh, before I changed. And uh, I didn't know at the time how lucky and helpful that was. All right, so how did I learn to stop worrying? Uh, well, let's get into our story with the call to adventure. All right, things have been pretty good in uh, our department of three teams. Uh, the team I get to work with, the teams we work closely with, uh, we're swimming along. Uh, like I said, I, I feel really honored to work with these people. Uh, we conquered a mountain of bugs. You see that arrow, do the sharp incline, we're just adding defects, customers were finding defects, we we're in billing, nobody likes to have defects billing. And then we got to turn that around and you see the sharp decline and we're down to one open defect for our group as of today. Um, and you know, we, we had this massive reduction, we were talking about tech debt next, um, our planning processes and our product vision were clearer than ever before. We had these objective measures, and then we had did some subjective measurements. Um, and, you know, we're, we're glad to celebrate these things. We're feeling pretty good about it. And we wanted to share and uh, present on these results and what contributed to this change. Um, so we were reflecting and, and trying to share what was going well. Some of the techniques we shared are pictured here. Uh, these are initiatives that uh, have been put into practice by various people on our teams. Uh, you see things there like one defect per sprint, which I'll touch on later. Uh, you see innovation days and uh, the product vision work, like I mentioned. So we were talking about all of these various things that we had done. And you can kind of see it's, it's like a smattering 
uh, you know, it's, it's a upping of our arsenal. And at the end of the presentation, a question came from the audience. Which hypotheses did you reject? Where did you fail and where did you learn? This was from a senior engineering manager in another department. And I got to have a good conversation with him afterwards. I really appreciated him asking that question. Uh, little did he know that the question really struck a chord. Sure, I could speak to things that hadn't worked great, but as a team, could we answer that question? If were my, would my answers be the same as the person I was working next to? Were we on the same page? What about in previous jobs? Does this mean I have completely failed as a scrum master? And in, in my mind, it felt a little bit like this. So I love my job and the role I get to play. Yet I've been surprised over time by feelings of frustration. You get on the call with the ambassador from Russia and you're trying to communicate and it's, it's, it's really, really muddling through. Um, yeah, frustration about communication, frustration about change management uh, within a team, in the team of teams, within the department. Something was not clicking. Uh, I am one who likes to go deeper, uh, learn more, really get to the bottom of things and really understand things in depth. And I started to think about this problem on the whole. And this frustration, I realized, was a good signal that perhaps there were expectations put by myself and by others you know, from our training of expectations of crafting a grand strategy and bad habits of using command and control to push for results. I already knew from uh, my training and experience that there's not one way to solve problems. Um, this is often talked about as, for example, uh, Scrum is one recipe in a cookbook and your master chefs um, have a bunch of recipes at their disposal and they know their ingredients inside and out, they know the recipes inside and out, they will uh, adapt to the situation, they will choose the appropriate tools, the appropriate ingredients for the situation at hand. So, so I knew that. I, I knew that there's not a one size fits all and I didn't think that was quite the problem here. Um, and also it was difficult to communicate that worldview of needing to be, needing to apply flexible solutions. It was difficult to communicate that worldview to others that I was working with. I get to think about this all day long. I get to think about uh, management and effectiveness and metrics. Um, but I don't want to be one person holding a set of solutions. I don't think that is viable. I don't think that is feasible. I don't think that is long lasting or fun. I want to work on the system to provide solutions. I needed a model where I could go even deeper. So entering the unknown, I was on a quest to understand. We are only as good as the models that we use to navigate the world. Knowing I needed a better mental model, I started this journey. The effectiveness of any knowledge work organization is a direct function of the kind of mindset shared collectively by all the folks working in the organization. Jumping straight to the point here. Uh, as I was reading and studying and talking to experts, I came across uh, this function. Uh, it's the Marshall model and the pieces fell into place. Effectiveness is a function of mindset. Mindset. Um, Shauna spoke to this in her discussions of learning and pivoting. Uh, our mindset defines how we go through the world. Our mindset defines how we work with others. Uh, this equation um, applies on a personal level and scales up to a company level. It's the ability to change and the ability to spread ideas which is essential uh, also to our effectiveness at building great things, building great products, uh, building great teams, and also our ability to uh, spread ideas and spread changes to be an evolving organization. This is another picture that I came across in my journey to learn more. 
and uh, I found it very helpful. I had a conflict that I was trying to resolve of, I knew some of these uh, topics, which I'll touch on more later. I knew things like decentralized control. I knew um, making room for surprises. I knew that those were important. And I knew that structures to enable people to be successful were just as important. So as I was trying to rectify that dissonance, I came across this, like I said, and I could really see where chaos and order need to live hand in hand. And that is where our new set of uh, management ideals and practices should live. The leadership in the overlap and your Venn diagram between chaos and order, that's where we wanna be. There are structures that empower people and yet there is an acceptance, there is room for the chaos, if you will, that leads to good, healthy change. Um, because if things aren't moving and, and things aren't changing, then it's it's stale and it's stagnant. You're, you know, you don't want to be over in the way the right side of the diagram in control where people are abject, they're checking out. This is um, this is the most efficient, and yet you will never get great things. And you don't want to be on the far left side either. That feels just as bad as a person operating in that model. So, um, yep, this map helps us understand the natures of, of problems and issues, that dissonance I was talking about. Um, and it, I see it as a style, a leadership style that we can use to be effective working across environments, being able to apply chaos or order in the appropriate place. And um, especially for me and the team I work on, this is a pressing reality. Uh, when I started, uh, we were a team of seven, then 13, then 25, and now our team of teams network is up to 70 approximately. Change is accelerating and the complexity is increasing. And uh, now is the time to get good at exercising this model. And uh, so this, this is a pretty high level. Like I said, this talk was gonna be about ideas, but I do have a, a couple more concrete hooks to share. I'll explain some mindsets of how to put these ideas into practice. So the first mindset that I think is really important is sense and respond. Uh, in that individuals, teams, companies need to get good at sense and respond. So uh, our first example here, I mentioned training in biology. And when I hear sense and respond, my brain first goes to uh, theory of life and theory of organisms, where the response to a stimulus is uh, one of the most important things. This is an amoeba proteus. Um, you can see that it is responding to its environment. Um, it has an incredible ability to detect external stimuli and make the appropriate reaction and you can tell this is a, a small organism, but so much of the evolution that's gone into it, so much of its energy is devoted to this very important ability to do sense and respond. And applying sense and respond to the product world. So here I'm showing you two contrasting ways of approaching uh, how we do change within an organization, how we build products. On the left, you see make and sell. So the, the make and sell model. We are going to have a closed system. We're going to get uh, put in place a strategy. Uh, there is a structure. We are gonna plug and play and we're just going to make as much of that product as efficiently as we can. And then on the right side, you see in contrast, sense and respond. Um, this is where you have a context and purpose. You know, you are still heading in an important direction, but it plays a different role with how you uh, operate, how you produce. It is more of a coordination of capabilities and adapting, uh, you can see, becomes more important. It has more prominence here. So the context and purpose is, is always there. And the most important activity is the coordination of capabilities. So um, let's say you are, uh, 
bringing a completely new product and you are trying to uh, validate your market, you would be on the right side with needing to have that lean startup mindset, needing to be really good at sense and respond. So this is a mindset and I wanna apply it back to uh, the example we had with our, our teams and thinking about what we had done to influence uh, our quality, our, our defects and our culture. We had been adding more initiatives to the shelves. We were trying lots of things, you know, no one can say that we weren't working really hard. Um, you know, continuous improvement, that was a definite focus for us. Um, but it felt like continuing to add changes. And it felt like we were missing the aspect of what were we learning? So going back to the sense and respond world, it's a, as the context changes, you also need to adapt your strategy. You need to adapt how you're doing things. And these practices that your team has and how you do work needs to change over time. And, uh, and it, going further, um, this is a great way to put this into practice. So you might be familiar with the OODA loop. I love thinking about the OODA loop. It applies in many different situations, many different uh, disciplines. And um, here, the lean manufacturing approach to the OODA loop is the sense, interpret, decide, and act. Um, that's how they categorize how you can apply sense and respond to your world. The thing that we had been missing as a team is this big glaring spot in the middle, the interpret and orient. Um, we needed to be more self-aware with how the things that we were doing are being effective in the environment, how we're making decisions, how we're evaluating all of the efforts that we're putting into the world. Um, there's a, a, a thinker uh, that I follow, Jim, Jim Lair. He's uh, a famous coach, coaching many of the world's highest performing athletes. And he talks about um, the voice in your head uh, serves as your coach all of the time. Your mindset at approaching the problems in your work, at approaching how you do work, that is always going to be there. And so adapting, um, sorry, adopting a sense and respond mindset means that you spend more time thinking about how you are sensing and responding, being intelligent about how you are approaching problems, realizing uh, what the voice in your head is, being able to really get to the heart of change and being able to move the needle past just making and selling new tactics. All right, so that was the mindset of sense and respond and a couple different ways that it applies and how related concepts fit in. For the next mindset, uh, how do we achieve this quickly? We have a lot of really talented people and we don't want to constrain them we want to empower them so that we can get to the best solutions quickly, that we can sense and respond, we can do it fast. Uh, you know, war is uh, way too important to be left to the politicians. They have neither the time, the training, nor the inclination for strategic thought. Another piece of satire uh, to lighten the mood on this mindset. Of course, I'm saying the opposite, is that the people closest to the work the people doing the work, uh, they are the ones who can do the strategic thought. They are the ones who need to be empowered through this decentralized control. And you might say, wow, that sounds kind of scary. How are you going to have a large company with everyone working in decentralized control? And the answer is that uh, it is not about lack of parameters, lack of structure. It is more about allowing the scale-free architecture to emerge. So this is about self-forming connections. This is about having those tight feedback loops. So that's why I started with sense and respond. It's a crucial element of this. And this is about the emergent, the very structure uh, that emerges there. 
um, think bacterial colony. The, it is amazing what a bacterial colony can do for independent pieces that um, can pass signals, uh, they can encounter problems in the environment, and they can actually change strategy. Um, this is an amazing way of looking at the world uh, where you can imagine that we can achieve these incredible networks scale free. Um, the, the nodes here, the agents, or the people we're talking about, uh, they interact using all kinds of communication channels. Um, there is different ways of coordinating actions. And this is especially important for sharing today because it can be a sustainable case of change because the very structure the change is accepted by and created by the groups. So a real life example, a secret about Spotify, um, their model is not as concrete as watching the famous Henrik Nyberg video would lead you to think. Their model is actually summed up very simply with try something. Ideas pass around the company, they're trying different things, if it works, they keep it. If it doesn't, they kill it. They have the context and purpose that is in place. And they are measuring. They're measuring productivity. They're measuring personal affinity. They're measuring market, market response. So they're measuring on the level that is impactful for the company. And it really works. So how does this communication go? Um, as you saw, there are various nodes that are, are connected and um, you can imagine how information passes through this network very quickly. And this is from uh, a paper by Dr. James Copeland. It shows that, um, you know, in an organization working in a very agile way, working with this, this scale free uh, pattern, that the connections between nodes, so between individuals, the uh, majority have about four connections. And that might match up with what you think about of the ideal size of a small agile team. And then on the far right of the graph, you see that there are some nodes that are exceptionally well connected. Um, these are, are people who are uh, hubs. Um, they're helping things flow. They are uh, serving a vital role in allowing this emergent structure to happen, et cetera. Um, these nodes can be people. They can also be a uh, structure as I'll talk about later. Um, as we're thinking about how these mindsets, how these ideas could change how we go about our organizations and our management, um, if you can think about this kind of collaboration and the very structure being a product, being a, a part of your company's secret sauce, uh, measurement and evaluation based on individual performance is extremely difficult in collaborations like what we expect of our teams. You know, healthy teams, if we are measuring on individuals, it can inhi inhibit participants from making decisions that are aligned with the broader system and the common agenda. And it can hamper their efforts to create these mutually reinforcing activities. And if we're having a self-forming network and we need things to grow and recede and, and change, um, then saying that we're going to measure uh, based on some static things just doesn't make sense. Um, and in a company, how does this come together with sense and respond to drive change? Going back to the first mindset again, this is a quote from Esther Derby in her uh, new book out in 2019. Uh, excellent. I would recommend it. She says that change is a social process. Um, the diffusion of ideas through these networks, it is a social process through which people talking to people spread an innovation. Um, and, you know, to quote uh, Stephen Covey, change happens at the speed of trust. Amanda Perkins uh, nodded to this earlier when she was saying uh, the, those connections between people, the power of having a conversation, um, that is really important to this working. Um, an example, uh, going way back to the uh, presentation to how our teams are doing with quality and the, and the things that we tried. 
So uh, one that I would say really exhibits uh, this mindset of decentralized control is we said that we wanted to find a way to shift our investment from just feature work to also their defects and our uh, tech debt. And uh, my colleague had the idea, what if we just commit to doing one defect per sprint per team? And because of her role in the team, because of the trust that she already had, because of, of people's knowledge of her competence and her abilities, uh, they were ready to commit to this and to shift things. And that, that I see as an example of a change that could be, um, could be longstanding, could be sustainable. We saw a, a different struggle where after we'd uh, you know, gotten so that we mostly had no defects, we needed to shift and we wanted to keep this quality train going. And we wanted to shift the perspective to not just one bug per sprint, but being able to work on our systems, being able to improve our deployments, being able to think holistically about it. And we found that that was a lot harder. And I think uh, we can attest that to change being a social process. We did not have the same uh, organic uh, or origin of that idea for it to spread and be successful. Okay, so the last mindset, um, we were talking about how do you be adaptable? How do you be a company that can uh, have the speed of ideas move really quickly in your projects and in your chain? And then we talked about um, how to do that uh, quickly uh, through our, our very structure, our very fabric. The next mindset I wanna talk about is uh, embracing the professionalism that we all bring to our jobs and embracing how we can do it well. So this mindset I wanna share is leveraging patterns. So if we are saying that more sharing is needed, leveraging these connections, how might we get better at collaborating with others on changing the very ways in which we work? And patterns are not new. Um, this is uh, widely accepted in the software community. It helps us document design constructs. Um, we use patterns to build software systems all the time. They give us a structured way of looking at a problem space. And um, it's a way that as a professional community, we can uh, share solutions which have been seen multiple times and have been proven multiple times. And uh, I would stress that we need to attend to how we use patterns for talking about change uh, just as much as we use it in our day jobs. Um, the whole point of the doomsday machine is lost if you keep it a secret. Um, this, is, this is pretty important to the crux of uh, Dr. Strangelove and the uh, change efforts that we're trying to engender, the um, things that we see about our environment uh, that we want to change. We need to get better at talking about those. Um, if we are working from these decentralized networks, if we are um, you know, scaling and, and doing things that are really big, we still need the ability to talk across disciplines, to talk across teams, uh, to get good at communicating uh, what we see that is happening in our environment and what we are learning, experimenting with to change it. So the first example of patterns and why this is such a cool mindset is force field analysis. So uh, starting with you know, what we see about the world, uh, what we observe, uh, there are lots of patterns that can help us break down our thinking, uh, break down problems and improve our thinking. Uh, really get, uh, more analytical or even see the picture more holistically. And in this example, force field analysis can help you say, um, we uh, are not as successful at this, or uh, we want to uh, push this initiative or we need to change this thing. Before you even go into it, um, you can break down what are the things that will propel, uh, what will, um, allow this change to happen and what will detract from it? What will 
be someone who thinks a different way or uh, a structure, you know, an incentive that is in place that will mean that we don't want to change. So this is a good way that we can talk to each other about what is happening in our world. I had this quote from Esther Derby where she says that uh, change is a social process. And I got to see one of her keynotes um, a couple of years ago. And she was talking about the concepts from the book, talking about complex systems and how they change. And she has mentioned that she definitely embraces uh, the decentralized control. She embraces uh, empowering individuals to contribute to this change process. And at the end, I asked, um, how do you track the change efforts? How do you communicate about them as a group? And she mentioned a little bit about that and it left me thinking. Uh, my, my quest was not over. Um, so talking about change uh, within this mindset of patterns, uh, the next example that I'm really excited about, um, this is a, a pattern of, uh, it's called an agile strategy map, um, but I think it could be used for a lot of things outside of purely, uh, you know, implementing an agile principle. Um, and you can see that you are making sense of the world and you're communicating about uh, past, present, and future. And the NC stands for necessary conditions. And as your group learns, as you get better and better, your map, it, it expands. And this can represent a set of accumulate, accumulated knowledge. Um, this is from Agile 42. Um, excited to uh, see where they go with that. Um, an example of this would be thinking about your uh, scale-free uh, perspective on a team. What you can do is you can simply uh, give it a name. You can say, here's a concept I know about uh, scale-free hubs, and here's how it works. And I think we should put uh, a communication channel in place for this. You give it a name, you talk about it, and then uh, it is visible, it is a pattern, it can be discussed as a group. So um, I hope you will sit with these ideas. Um, mindset, mindset, mindset. Of course, there's still a role for measurement, structure, and patterns but our mindset about how we build and how we change needs an overhaul. Um, I'm excited to continue working with these ideas. Uh, I think there's a lot of fertile ground here and I'm excited to keep uh, writing and speaking about it in the future. So thanks again. And I encourage you to reach out with questions and ideas.